Welcome to a tutorial video on Twine 2.0. In this video, I'm going to go over all of the setup and the necessary connections to build a grander case study of how to use different techniques in Twine 2.0. I'm calling this Murder Hill House Mystery. And it's based a little bit, okay, kind of a lot, on the game Clue or Cluedo. So in this part one, I'm going to combine the following different techniques. Be combining HTML and macro usage in a single passage. I'm going to talk about an explicit inventory system. We're also going to talk about spatial navigation using a table. So let's go to the story. Hi, welcome to Murder Hill House Mystery. In this game, you will investigate a murder in the appropriately named Murder Hill House. What an odd name for a house that has a murder, you say to yourself quietly. Shh. <laughs> Your job is to interview people. We're going to collect some clues and we're going to try to solve the murder. So are we ready, detective? So say, I'm ready. <laughs> As you approach the house, you're given a map by the first officer at the scene. Here, sir, she says, I've marked the rooms for you. Everyone was told to stay where they were. You can interview them whenever you want. And so we see two other things other than this introductory text here. We see nine rooms that are links arranged in three sets of three. We also see something visually different, a notebook here, as uh, weapons, people, and places. And just like the game Clue or Cluedo, we already know a little bit here. We know Candlestick, and we know Miss Scarlet, and we know Ballroom. But, you know what, let's go to the library. Uh, well, there's not ha much happening in the library at the moment, obviously. But what we see is this library, you were here. Well, let's go to the lounge. It says, lounge, you were here, and it lists up the links. We have the ballroom, cellar, and the hall, study, observatory, and the kitchen. So we can navigate around the house, but there's nobody really here at the moment, and there's not much going, going on other than looking at the map. So let's go back to the code here for a second. So my start passage is pretty simple. It's what I talked about. This is in this part and it lists everything I said. Moving over to story, well, this is where it gets a little more interesting. After the initial text, it says display, using the display macro, the passage story init. Now, in other story formats that aren't Harlow, sometimes the passage name story init is a special name and it means it gets run first and you can use it to initialize your story any variables you want to use or any values you want to set you can run that first and so that's what I've done here a little bit I've got three separate variables weapons rooms and suspects for each variable they're set to a data map of a value and a key and in this case it's all of the values from the game Clue or Cluedo set to either true or false. And the first in each of these, Candlestick true, Ballroom true, Miss Scarlet true. Well, that's what we saw when I ran it. Those were the things we know about. So this is an example of an explicit inventory. That is, a user or a player, however you want to think of, the, of whoever's using this, already has something. They explicitly have them. Like, they have all of the weapons, and they have all of the rooms, and they have all of the suspects. But their knowledge is sort of turned on or off. It's either true or it's false. And in this case, we can check something like the weapon's candlestick, in this case, is true, but the room's kitchen is false, and the suspect's Professor Plum is also false. So we saw in story, when the story starts, we initialize all of those variables to either true or false for all of the data map. Then we go to I'm ready. Now I'm ready, of course, has some initialized text here, something we're looking at. And then it has an example of using a table for spatial navigation. Well, and as you can see here, we point at the kitchen, the ballroom, the conservatory, the dining room, the cellar, and the library, the lounge, the hall, and the study. So let's go, let's look at those places here. Well, as you can see, they're all kind of a mess. Since they're pointing at each other, 
Flynn draws lines to each one of them, and of course it looks kind of confusing glancing at it. But let's pull up table here. Let's pull up kitchen. And kitchen, of course, is made of a table. So we have a table, it has a caption map, and it has three rows, each with three data entries. And we were using that when we were playing it as navigation. Kitchen, dining room, cellar, etc. So we have kitchen, you are here, and then links to each other place. Ballroom, conservatory, dining room, cellar, library, lounge, hall, study. And we're using the layout to create a visually similar layout to where, to how Clue or Cluedo would look. Kitchen, ballroom, conservatory is the first row, dining room, cellar, library, second row, third row, lounge, hall, study. And so we're always looking at the map as if we were looking down at the house, or as I started at the beginning of the story, we're actually looking at a map. So we have nine different places to go to, and we're using a table to visually display that information for us. And so, of course, as you might guess, ballroom, just as ballroom, you are here and links everywhere else, and study, same deal. Now, one of the ways I like to think of passages within stories is as places. So I go to a place, I go to a passage, or I follow a passage to a place, depending on how you want to think about it. And so all of my places in the story, kitchen, ballroom, conservatory, etc., 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 study, are all linked to each other. They're all places here. And so in later parts of this video series, each time you go to a place, you'll have a chance to talk to people or do things. But you always have the ability to go to other places. And so that's sort of what we also have set up here. In this first part of this video series, we have a couple of different things going on. As I mentioned, we're combining HTML and macro usage. Right here, notebook, because all of this is a div or a division with the class notebook. And we have weapons, people, and places. Each one, in turn, is an unordered list, a UL. A U L, a U L, and if something is true within weapons, if weapons candlestick is true or weapons knife is true, it would then conditionally display a line item, either candlestick or knife or lead pipe or revolver, so and so and so and so, for suspects, for weapons, for suspects, and for rooms. But this is all an explicit inventory, of course. The player already has all of these things, they're just turned on and off. Although they don't perceive that they have them until they know them. Which is kind of a complicated concept. But we're mixing HTML and Twine's macros. So we have an unordered list, for example, here in the weapons. But each line item only appears if it's true, as was set in the story in that passage. So weapons was set to the data map of key, candlestick, to value true, knife, key, to value false, etc., etc., for each one, with weapons, rooms, and suspects. In our notebook, as we learn things, we can check them off. Oh, we know about this, or we know about that. Now, the reason why this is a whole division, a whole div here, so I can make it visually different. And I did that by editing the story style sheet. So we say notebook has a border of two pixels solid black. So it separates visually notebook from everything else. And the there's two other things as a way to close this out that I'm doing with the style sheet. I'm saying, okay, for all tables, the border spacing, the spacing between each entry in the each table data entry should be 20 pixels, and the border collapse should be separate. So what this produced is this, where there are 20 pixels between each item in the table. And should a section not have it, it would not collapse, it would separate. So we see 
a nice clean separation of all the items with 20 pixels. And then the last thing I'm doing here is I'm hiding the sidebar. In the Harlow story format, the sidebar, the undo redo that's on the left hand side, is the TW sidebar element. Well, you can hide it if you want by setting its display to none. So it isn't displayed and it's effectively hidden and therefore unusable to the user. If they can't get to it because it's hidden, then they can't use it. So we can set its display to none to re effectively remove it as an option for the player to use. So we're hiding the sidebar and we're adding a little bit of extra style to a table and we're using our notebook as a border of two pixels in solid black. And as we saw, That means when we look at the notebook, it has its borders, along with HTML that is combined with Twine macros. And we're also seeing spatial navigation through the use of a table. And we can go to the ballroom, and the cellar, and the hall, and study, and all around the house. Well, there isn't much to do at the moment, but it's still fun to click on things. <laughs> So, as you saw in this first part of this video series, we're just setting everything up. Just a matter of setting up our variables, setting up our places as passages, and setting up our notebook, although we're not actually collecting anything in the moment. And then in the second and third part of this series, we'll actually add the people, the suspects we can talk to to find out who done it. And we can use, once we've talked to them, that knowledge to put in our notebook. We can turn things on or off using our explicit inventory. And that's all that's set up in this first part. Thanks for watching.